Today our title is our study, The Angel's Song. You know, over the last two weeks, we've been looking at the songs found in the opening chapters of the Book of Luke. They are, as I previously said, the very first Christmas carols, praising God for the coming of the Lord. You know, we've studied the Magnificat, that's Mary's song, from Luke chapter 1, verse 46. And then last week, we looked at the Benedictus, that Zechariah song from Luke chapter 1, verse 66 onwards. Today, we're looking at the song of the angels that they sung around the shepherds while they kept their watch by night over the flocks in the field. It's often called the Gloria because they sang glory to God. And so let's turn to Luke chapter 2, the verse 8 to 20, and it's on page 800. In the Hebrew Bible. Luke chapter 2, verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all of people. that. Oh, all the great joy that will be for all the people. Today is in the town of David. A Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor is. And when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And so they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. The reading this morning is somewhat like a mountain. It begins the ascent, the climb begins in verse 8. There's the level ground at the foot of the mountain. The ordinary rural scene of shepherds looking after their flocks, watching over them in the night. But then from there on, our pathway begins to very quickly rise up to higher elevations. The angel of the Lord appears to them and announces the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Until by verse 14, we find ourselves at the summit, standing on the mountaintop, surrounded by countless angels of the heavenly choir, all of them singing the glory. And it's a beautiful moment, and one, as you look at the angel's song, that gives us a view of the entire landscape of saving benefits purchased by our Lord Jesus Christ for all who believe. Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favour is. That's the climactic moment in this short passage. The angelic choir singing praises as Jesus' birth is announced. Sometimes in our rush to get to the top, to see the wonder of that moment in our mind's eyes, we might miss some of the rest of the landscape along the way. And so let's be careful as we consider the angelic song. So that first of all, we notice the landscape along the way uh, to that mountaintop moment. If you look at the passage, you will see that it's a bit of an upside-down, topsy-turvy landscape because that's the nature of the kingdom that Jesus' coming brings. If you look at the reading, I want you to notice, to our mind's eyes, some of the upside-down values of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. The first thing I want you to think about is the role and the place of these shepherds. 
The angels were not sent to kings sitting upon regal thrones, nor to generals at the head of an army, nor to some great philosopher studying those complexities of logic. The angels are sent to shepherds, to everyday people. The great good news that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, that he so loved the world that now he has given his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That very good news is announced to shepherds. It didn't make the headline news. And some of you can remember big news-making events in our lifetime and what you were doing. You know where you were exactly when they happened. Some of you remember the Erebus crash or the Christchurch earthquakes, for example. And most of us remember where we were when we heard about the Twin Towers falling on 9-11. But on that night, when the single greatest moment in human history took place, and God the Creator stepped down onto earth and into time as a human in Jesus Christ, there was no one taking notice. The majority of the world's population in that moment would not have turned to one another in the after days and said, well, I remember where I was when that took place. But there was a handful of rough, uneducated shepherds in the middle of the countryside in the dead of night. They are the ones that the angelic messenger is sent to and above whom the choirs of heaven begin their song. It's astonishing. For in those days, a status of a shepherd was thought to be on a par with tax collector, or today we might say a loan shark. Not honourable, but how a near universal. You know, the rabbis, they prohibited the devout Jews from buying wool, milk, or meat from the shepherds on the assumption that it was most likely stolen property. It said, and I'm quoting, no position in the world is as despised as that of the shepherd. They were considered to be so untrustworthy that their testimony was inadmissible in the court of courts. They were, by all accounts, the lowest of the low. They were unclean, unreliable, universally considered petty thieves, whose word would never be trusted. It's not the career choice that you'd want your children to make. You know, if country music had been popular back then, there would have been the song, Mama, don't let your baby grow up to be a shepherd by Garth Brooks. That would have been a massive hit. And yet it was to them that the angelic messenger came. And before them, the heavenly choir burst into song. Actually, given how they felt about the shepherds, the rabbis really were wrestling with the passages like Psalm 23 that declared that the Lord himself is our shepherd. How can it be that God is a shepherd? A shepherd? Ironically, this actually provides part of the answer to the question, why did the angels make the announcement of the birth of Christ to the shepherds? For the Lord is a shepherd. That's why. When he becomes a man in Jesus Christ to tend his flock and to lead his people to green pastures and quiet waters, he comes, of course, to shepherd country. In particular, notice that he comes to the city of David, Bethlehem, Israel's greatest king, from who the Messiah would descend from was King David. But before he was a great king, David was a shepherd. He was tending flocks in these very same fields over which the angels sang that night. God who comes among us in Jesus comes to shepherd his people. Notice this message here. It's not for the mighty and the good. It's not for the wise and the elite. For they are almost misunderstanding his message and his mission. But the outsider and the unclean he shepherds. They are the targets of his love from the beginning. For Jesus, the shepherd king, came on a mission for people like these men tending their flocks by night. And the message of Christmas is that in Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God is for sinners, not for the perfect saints. He is for the screw-ups, not for the all-stars. 
And you will remember that Jesus said, it's not the healthy who needs a doctor, but the sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. And it's the upside down nature of the kingdom that Jesus coming brings and offers. The message of Christmas is that Jesus Christ, the shepherd king, came for you. Jesus' birth, that first Christmas message, was for shepherds, not kings. It was for the outsiders, not the elites, the sinners in need of a saviour for you and me. I want you to notice, secondly, as we continue thinking about this upside-down value of the kingdom that Jesus brings, that he comes not to cause fear, but to bring joy. As we look at the passage, we see it in the middle of, it's in the middle of the night. And the Greek text says that the shepherds were literally watching the watches, probably indicating that they divided up the night into various watches, and they were taking it in turns. The rest of them were getting some sleep, while some of them remained awake to watch over the flock. And so the bulk of the camp that night was sound asleep. There was probably one or two shepherds attending to the flock. It would have rarely been country dark, rarely dark, except for some flickering light from the campfire and the odd bleating of a sheep. And then suddenly someone flicks that switch as it was, the brightest of the brightest of the stadium floodlights engulfed these shepherds. Verse 9, an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. You know, we don't like being surprised out of a deep sleep in the middle of the night. So I can't imagine how terrifying this moment must have been for these shepherds. Luke says they were terrified, filled with the greatest fear. The glory of God shines around them. And there's a sense in which they were perfectly right to be scared, for they are sinful men like us, guilty in the sight of God. And now the glory of the Lord God Almighty engulfs them. Is this judgment day? They must have been thinking at least one of these thoughts racing through their minds. They feel like the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 6 when he sees the Lord high and lifted up the train of his robe filling the temple, and he falls down and he says, Woe to me, I am ruined. I am undone, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. The shepherds are terrified as the glory of the holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty surrounds them. And that's actually what our sin does to us when we we are brought into the presence of God, our sin condemns. But notice the first words of the angelic message. The first words are, Fear not. Don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy to the people. You know, one day, Jesus will come to judge the world. And on that day, all those who have rejected him and refused his lordship, every unbelieving heart, will have grounds for fear. But the angel is explaining that today, Jesus has come to drive out fear. His coming is good news that will bring great joy. Actually, Jesus' coming drives out fear in a couple of ways. First of all, he drives out the fear of failure. You see, you cannot fail when you don't have to qualify. You can't fail if acceptance with God is offered not on the basis of your qualifications, it's offered to you as a free gift. Because the one who was born of a virgin and laid in the manger and was nailed to the cross, he was qualified for you. And all who know him don't need to fear the rejection of God. Though they may have been sinners born short of the glory of God in Jesus Christ, they are forgiven, pardoned, and accepted. And so the second great fear that Jesus' coming drives out is the fear of condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The child born of a virgin was a condemned in our place so that there's no condemnation for us who trust in him. As these truths enter into your consciousness, they tend to ignite a spark of joy. For you are accepted through Jesus Christ and it's free. What a gift has been given in Jesus Christ. And those who receive it will not know fear, but joy. 
You know, Jesus came for shepherds, not kings. He brings joy, not fear. And then thirdly, we see the upside-down value of the kingdom. Perhaps nowhere more clearly than this, the king born in a state. God the Son laid in the manger. In verses 11 and 12, the angel explains the good news, the source of joy that will be for all people. It is this child, born that very day, who is Christ the Lord. He's born, notice, in Bethlehem, the city of David. His family comes, as verse 5 explains, from the house in the lineage of David, which means that this child is the heir of David's throne. And it will bring the fulfillment of the prophecy from Micah 5. But you, Bethlehem and Petra, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. How will this mighty king from old, this ancient saviour, be known? What is the badge of majesty that will set him apart and identify him as that Davidic monarch? who will rule and reign and redeem his people. This will be the sign for you. You'll find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. You know, the Lord of glory who upholds the universe, he's sleeping in a cattle feed trough. Don't you think that your God is beyond your reach? Seeing him lying in a manger, in a stable for you, the lowest of us may not be. See how far he's stooped to reach out to you in his love. He's come all the way down. That a nipper maker, he's made a dependent baby. That everywhere present God who fills the cosmos is bound up in swaddling cloths. And it's going to be a pattern as you read through the gospel story that will characterize the entire life of the Lord Jesus Christ. He who had no proper bed in his infancy would have none in his adulthood. Jesus said, Foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no bed to lay his head. He who was bound with the common band as a nursing babe to get his bed would be bound by the shackles as a criminal at the cross. He who was unnoticed at his first coming would be despised and rejected at his crucifixion. The one heralded as the Son of David laid in a manger, would be called the king of the Jews and male to a prince. And so he is the greatest of the upside-down values of the world. The one that gives meaning to and becomes the reason of all the others. God became man. The king is laid in the manger, and the Lord and giver of life has born a helpless, dependent child and is crucified, dead, and buried. And so as the angel announces that extraordinary news to the shepherds, is there any really great wonder that heaven splits open and the night times chased away? The angel, it seems, the host of heaven have been eavesdropping. And as they hear about the coming of Jesus and the circumstances of his coming, it's as though they can't contain themselves anymore. First Peter 1.12 says, These are things into which the angels long to look. And there's only perhaps an intellectual understanding of the meaning of Christ coming to the angels. They are never the recipients of that redeeming love, for Jesus did not come to the angels. These extraordinary, glorious, mighty ones who have dwelt wherever in the near presence of the Holy God, he didn't come for them. He came for guilty sinners like me and you. He's come to dwell in a fallen world. And so picture the scene. It's like everyone is packed into this darkened room, waiting for the surprise party. The lights are out, and then suddenly someone opens up the door and flicks on the light switch, and now the angels jump out from cover and join the celebration. Glory to God, and on earth, peace, they start to sing. You know, the final thing to see about that upside down and back front value of the kingdom that Jesus brings, Jesus first came to shepherd not kings, for sinners, not the righteous. Secondly, he came to bring joy, not fear. Thirdly, he came as the king of kings in humble obscurity. And finally, notice, he comes to bring glory to God 
and peace for the world. These are the consequences and the effects of Jesus coming. That's what Christmas is really about, the glory of God and peace for men and women through faith in Jesus Christ. In a world that says to God, my will be done, glory to me, and yet finds consistently that it's peace, it's own, our peace, it really eludes us. We say, glory to me, my will be done, and our peace is not there. Jesus was born to say to God, thy will be done. And when the nails were pounded into his hands and feet and the thorns punched into his brow, what peace was his was shattered. It was for the glory of God and the peace of man. We are so wrapped up in the pursuit of our own glory that Jesus surrendered his peace in pursuit of God's glory, and he won peace for us all. There is a peace with God and peace from God for you in Jesus Christ this Christmas. And so when you turn your eyes to Jesus Christ and you learn to sing with the angels, glory to God, then your peace will come. And so what a gift we've been given this Christmas. The Christmas gospel that God should become man for us and for our salvation to give us peace and joy in place of fear and alienation. And so may the Lord be gracious to us to bring us before the Lord Jesus Christ. And like the angels, we may begin to sing with more than our lips, but with our hearts and lives. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace with those upon whom he is placed. And so may it be that every one of us here may know that peace this Christmas as we trust in Jesus Christ, who himself is our peace.